a person actually, um, uh, Denise is from Airbnb, and you can talk to him afterwards. He does volunteerism. He, he's a good professional to, uh, to ask questions. So he's right there, raise your hand so that we know. But anyway, um, we'll start this panel. And um, I am uh, so pleased to be part of this panel. We have something in common here. I love uh, adventure travel. I'm a skier and I have a fellow uh, skier here. It's, well, he was my guide when we went together to Greenland to ski. So it's, uh, Brennan is a pro skier um, and he's also a professor at the Sierra Nevada College in Tahoe. Yes, we have, we have a group there traveling with him here. Um, and Paige is actually also a professor and she uh, teaches uh, tourism in terms of, um, I'll let her actually explain, she has a lot of research around uh, that and she teaches at Sta San Francisco State University. Are there anybody from San Francisco State here right now? A couple of people here, that's awesome. Okay, um, I'd like to, I don't want to give you too much introduction, but I'd like each one of you to tell us all about your work. And, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, conversations here around sustainable communities and around um, why and why we do what we do. And I'm sure there are a lot of um, young people here in the audience that like to start projects and they think of um, entering a community and bringing change there. Uh, what are the, uh, the things they should consider? So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, just the questions to answer those Well, um, hi everyone. I think the first thing when I think of where Galena and I were able to meet and work together is not necessarily why I wanted to be there in a sense, but when I was there, the people that I was engaging with. In, in our last presentation, we kind of had this moment of the who to attach to the why. And I think about the times that I got to know the folks that I worked with in Greenland prior to meeting Galena and yes, my initial assignment there was to go as a ski guide of taking people skiing to different places around the world, and that was part of the work, and we had this partnership through an organization that I worked with, right? So the organization set it up, they're like, Brennan, this is your assignment, you're gonna go to this place, you're gonna work with these people, and we know that you know how to ski and do this kind of what we would call on-site skiing, where you're going to places that other people haven't really ever skied before and you're figuring it out on the fly, so it's a, a different sort of model. But what I would do over the periods of time when I was hanging out with, um, with our crew on the ground there is I would listen to them and ask, you know, is it nice to have these groups here? Are you happy that I'm here? Um, what are the kind of things that you are looking to do in your community, in the community we were hanging out in is System U Greenland. It's the second largest municipality in all of Greenland, and it has 5,000 people. Greenland's a really large area in terms of land mass, but 55,000 people comprise the whole island. Think about that. 55,000 people are cruising around right outside the, the windows right now. Um, but I really think about that who. And when you go there, you know, we were able to, as Galena knows, the people we were able to spend time with, they would say, you know, we, we really like having you here, but this is what our issues are. We'd like to have more people visit Greenland because people are coming to visit the Arctic and these different places. Um, but we want our people to be engaged in these visitors that are coming here. We want to be able to have um, opportunities, jobs, um, things of that nature. In Greenland, they have a, a history of colonialism. They have a history of multinational corporations coming in and looking for resources and not working with local communities. And we have these, there's other issues like in Greenland throughout other Arctic nations as well, you can kind of connect these things. So what I would hear over the years that I've been there is, we like when you come here, what can we do to kind of sustain this level of people coming to visit, being inspired by our landscape, learning about our people, and having this, this deeper sort of relationship. So as much as my assignment was to go there again and, and ski and kind of go across this land, it really became listening to the folks and asking, what can I do for you, not in just, and I, and I mean this respectfully, not in the sense of me showing up and being like, hey, I'm here with good intentions and I wanna do something. 
right? There's, there's a difference between doing that and actually listening to being invited back into a community and saying, you know, this is how we'd like to partner with you, not the other way around. Because historically, we can see that through colonization and other models that have shaped the world that we live in today and why it's so important to understand historical context before we just jump into any of these conversations is what about them asking me what I can do for them rather than me showing up and being like, oh, it would be great if you do this and that. And you can bounce these kind of ideas, but over time you, you start to develop a much more um, shared experience with the folks that you're working with. And I think that for a lot of us, ultimately your intention might be grounded within that as well. Um, wanting to do something more long lasting than just have this one little experience. I, I tend to really think of things in terms of informed experiences not just going and experiencing something and having it for yourself, but what, what informs that experience? What, what took place before that allowed you to get to that place and what's that future vision? So, um, so that's a, a lot of, I've done a lot of work in the Arctic Refuge in Alaska and other Arctic areas. And um, I see there's a lot of connecting sort of issues there in those sense, but I'll, I wanna pass the page for a little before I just like keep talking forever. <laughs> We're professors. I know, they, they know. Like, <laughs> they give you 15 you minutes, you're know. like, no way. I need 50 minutes at least, <laughs> right, minimum. Um, so thank you for having me here, first of all. Um, I have not been to Greenland yet, but actually Galena and I connected because I was invited to go to, to Sweden. I don't know, I'm still learning some things about it there. Um, so my area of research is sustainable community-based um, development and adventure travel is actually, or adventure tourism is, my other area of research, so they somewhat align because I believe that adventure travel, um, that kind of development is something that is more um, conscientious of the environment and, and the culture as well as the economy. Um, so the folks that invited me to um, Greenland connected me with Galena and she came and spoke to my class, which is great. And I'll be going to Greenland in November to really talk about the community there about um, how can they use adventure travel as a means of uh, protecting their culture um, and uh, the environment. So um, I kind of see adventure travel, um, and I know we started out kind of what is adventure? Um, so I worked with the Adventure Travel Trade Association, um, they're a trade association of tour operators and people interested in, in uh, the adventure business, and we came up with a definition of adventure, so there is a definition. Oftentimes people think it's bungee jumping or really extreme sports, but really um, adventure is anything that combines the, the culture, um, the environment, and then an activity. So um, like beauty, which is in the eye of the beholder, adventure, it's dependent on who you are. I'm sure you're gonna be a little bit more extreme. You, you all are skiers, but even if it's going to Patagonia and having mate with the gauchos um, after going horseback riding on the pampas, that's adventure, right? So it's very individualized. So I get really excited about adventure. In my previous life, I was a travel agent and I got to travel around the world, you know, going on, on these adventures. And I really feel like adventure, um, it fulfills personal dreams, right? And I think it promotes environmental sustainability. So that's why it's, uh, why it's important to me. And um, as Brennan mentioned, I think when we talk about tourism development, I can't go into a place and say, yes, this is perfect for adventure, and this is what you should do. There has to be some reciprocity there, like what do you as a community want, and what do you want to share in Greenland? And um, right now they're saying, we'd like to learn more about adventure. Certainly there are a number of activities already there that are aligned with adventure, but I think it's important that we honor the culture that is there, and that that's a part, and they understand that creating um, Creating experiences that incorporate that culture is what is going to be sustainable for them as a community. You can't export culture, right? You can, you can put a Starbucks wherever, you can put a McDonald's, but um, if you want it to be sustainable, you really have to focus on something that can't be exported. Um, I've worked with rural communities, um, so it doesn't have to be that you have to have this wonderful resource. Um, even in a real, in, in a rural community, Community, and there could be something that's unique about that community that they can share. And I think everything that we've talked about um, today, this idea of quality of life, um, is kind of this overarching umbrella. You know, the quality of life for youth, 
the quality of life for people who are traveling or, or people who are trying to start a business or whatever it may be. Um, so helping a community be a good place for the residents as well as for the visitors because I think um, a nice place to live is a nice place to visit. And I think the work that um, we try and do is helping communities like in Greenland, okay, if this is what, um, if your culture is important, important to you, sharing that um, culture and providing jobs for the people that are there and protecting the environment are gonna be a key piece of that, I think. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's outstanding. I wanted to ask, you know, people are really, there are a lot of um, culture just even presented in this auditorium. And so a lot of, uh, I know a lot of youth has been traveling back to their family or origin countries, which is sometimes it might not even be the first generation that their parents, maybe even the second or third. And um, as uh, previous speakers mentioned, like Iram actually was the one, that when you think of, when you go to the uh, specific when you're traveling places and you see people have less than you here in Silicon Valley, the next thing that you usually see with the projects that young people do is they feel like they need to bring something into that country. A lot of times these are material goods. There would be soccer balls, you know, could be um, athletic jersey. We had, um, you know, we had people who actually were connected with colleges and they were getting their used things and bringing it to Africa, thinking that they are solving some kind of issue. And a lot of that happens while you are traveling, supposedly to the families, uh, like that's like a family vacation. Um, so if I were to ask you as experts in, in travel and sustainable communities, what would be the the suggestions that you can give to the youth that will be traveling through those communities that are third world countries and uh, in as they're thinking to create their own projects, what they should be aware of and how to think about through issues. And, and I, it might be, in, in don't be afraid to repeat the information that was um, uh, said with previous uh, previous speakers because I think making the point again and again will actually drive um, drive the truth. So uh, what would you say? Um, I think the, the most important thing is identifying some kind of a community partner before you go there. Do your homework in advance because, you know, we already heard that stated, you know, what's, if you're the only person that's involved in it, then what's the, you know, the lifespan of that? So again, long term, identifying a local community partner, that's always been essential to my work um, wherever I've been that I'm working with those people saying what are your needs not me going and putting upon them you know oh I think you need this right um, I have a friend who opened a, a lodge in Kenya and they were doing all these building and they felt uh, built housing for the people who would be working at um, at their lodge and you know they set up the toilet so they would set up a, a toilet in, in you know North America and that isn't what they wanted. They were standing on top of the toilet seat. The toilet seats were being broken. So why should I assume that how I live is how my workers want to live? So involving all the various stakeholders to come up with something that works, I think is important. So identify a community partner and collaborate and discuss and don't go in with any preconceived notions would be um, my suggestion. Yeah, I would support that and reiterate that it's really not, ask yourselves why you want to go to such and such place in the first place. Why do you want to engage in this particular area of the world or these groups of people? What, why are you going there in the first place? It's really not about you, you know? It's not, it's about reaching out. I, I'm thinking of my friend right now that I just sent something to. Um, her name is Sarah James. She's a mentor of mine um, in the Gwich'in tribe in, um, Arctic Village, Alaska, and she always says when we bring when we bring folks up there, she just looks and she's like, "Don't send me any trinkets," and she just laughs with kind of that grandma style. That's like she's like, "No, seriously, don't don't send me any trinkets," because people do, and they think that it's nice, but that's not what they need. They need other things. They don't have. They, they live in a remote village in Alaska that is reservation land, but they don't have access to certain things like 
toilet paper and hand sanitizer and coffee, things that they really like to have. So if you want to send them something, they're, they're open to telling you this is what we'd really like to have and these are the things that, that we need. So reiterating that whether it's a community partner or someone that you're working with, it's about flipping the script around from where I know I was taught in the past that it's okay to go and do that because you know, you're just bringing this good intention. Good intentions have led the world astray in many different areas. At the same time, if you're bringing that and you're really open to it, listen to those community partners, listen to the people that you're connecting with and you're working with, and don't be the one that places a pawn. Someone else's idea of poverty is, is not the same. Absolutely not. Um, somebody made a comment about, um, I think it was in the last presentation, about sometimes I think it'd be nice to, to wake up and not have to check my email or my pictures or do all of that. There are people that, that do that. And there's other people that would look at them and say, oh, isn't that too bad that you don't have access to what I have access to? And, and you see that it's really not about that shared idea you're placing upon. You know, you need to like flip that around. I think um, when we talk about research and such, um, someone I still pull from quite a bit is Sandra Harding, Standpoint Theory. If we want to do that right now and just drop, I'll do it, say it really quickly. But I still think today that Standpoint Theory does a lot to ask about the perspective of someone whose voices has been voice has been marginalized or disenfranchised. Give those people the perspective to put their voice out there rather than the ones that have historically been in charge, quote unquote. Hence our global north, global south. This whole idea of like, is still the whole idea of a developing world, right? Yeah, and I also wanted to ask you a question. So you, each individually, you do a research. Uh, in some areas, and I know some of uh, the youth in the audience, not many are just running to do something, but some of them are very interested in public policy. They're also interested in uh, partnering in research while they're still in high school or maybe in college. So um, I would would like to ask you personally, how other, how this youth can engage in the research? Like how can, do you even look for people who can help you with research? How they can, um, maybe what are the different levels if they're in high school, how they can engage, if they're in college. Also if professors are somewhere far, like let's say somebody in New York is interested in research that we're doing, you are doing here, do you reach out, uh, you know, can they reach out to you or how does this whole process work? How can students get involved on the level of uh, re research and being part of it. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people. I mean, my crew and I this morning, I was, I was like, if you meet someone or you don't even meet someone, you just hear something today and you're interested in what that person had to say or what they're bringing to the table, go up and introduce yourself. Go, go say hi. Don't be afraid. This is, this is a beautiful space like that. And these kind of spaces, over, over time, I've realized that these are just as important as anything else that you can possibly do is to just connect with other people and see what they're, where, where they're coming from and what you might be able to share, what they can share with you. In terms of research, um, we, we saw some other slides that were really speaking about the idea of purpose and passion. And I think about that a lot. What is it that brings out the best in you? We all know what it feels like when you're just like, I can't deny it, you know, right? You know that feeling when you're just like, I, I'm just alive right now and I'm, and I'm feeling, or I, for me, I, I just kept asking myself over time as being someone that came from the mountains, born in mountain communities my whole life, skiing was never this elitist thing that it can be a lot of times over around the world and in this country. It wasn't like that to me, it's just something like a part of where I live, but I kept asking these questions, spending time in the outdoors. Why do these problems exist? Why are people telling me that the rivers are, are um, Polluted. Why are the trees going away and they're saying that the animals can't live there anymore? And then I kept asking, what, what's going on with this problem with the earth? And I realized there's problems with people. Why is it that people are treated in such a way? Why do we have a history like this? I kept asking these questions and then I'd look for people to reach out to and say, maybe these folks can help me out. Maybe I, maybe I can reach out to what work they're doing and they can put me in a direction where I can start to answer these questions because some people are telling me that's just the way it is. And I never, ever, and still to this day, just won't take that. It's not just the way that it is. The systems that govern this world in which we live are, are created by humans. You know, when we look at the economical, the economics and the, and the political side of things, the power 
and the flow you know, that comes from systems humans have created can that not change. So I've looked at researchers over time to say, what can I learn from them? Maybe we could collaborate or connect in some way, shape, or form, and then what sort of ideas can I share to that and have a, a sense of contribution? You gotta, you gotta reach out. You, know, you gotta listen to yourself when, when you're feeling alive and don't put that down and keep going. It's something that I would, I would offer. I share Brennan's um, curiosity, really, but it's that action that you take if you're curious about something. Um, reach out and, and make connections. Um, students play a big role in the, the research that I do, and the research that I do um, helps to teach in the classroom. Uh, a project that I worked on in Eastern North Carolina was actually the idea of students. We went into this community, and the community said, we want to increase recreational use of our river. You know, people weren't respecting the river. So what can we do? And I took a group of students in there. We went out and did a paddle on the river, and we looked at what the community had to offer, and the students had this idea for building a tree house. They said, well, you could put a tree house, you know, in this community. So we discussed it with the, the mayor and some of the board of commissioners and some of the local residents were there, you know, with, with the group of students. And from that idea that the students had, it started this conversation about, well, could we really do this? And then the students said, well, there's this gentleman who's out in Oregon and he uh, has a tree house um, kind of accommodation place and he builds tree houses that are real tree houses, like in the tree. So we found a little grant money and we invited him to come and the students interviewed him. And it, it wasn't like a quick thing. This was over a couple of years, but we actually applied for a grant we got funding to build a universally accessible treehouse so someone in a wheelchair can get into the treehouse and spend the night. They're not fancy or anything. It's not like that treehouse guy with the you know king size pillow top beds and things like that. I mean, it's camping more or less, but if you think about the number of people in terms of even the military who come back who've been very active outdoors people and they come back, that doesn't mean they don't want to be in the outdoors anymore. So making it accessible that somebody can sustain that lifestyle. If something happened to you, you still are an outdoors person. You're skiing, so wouldn't you want somebody to find a way that you could ski, adapt it, right? So from this idea with the students, this project actually happened, and now they've actually built like three more tree houses in this area. Um, the community has a sense of pride about it because they're cleaning up around the river because they're having visitors come. The residents have a sense of pride. And the students, it all came from them. So in the classroom, we talk about the importance of stakeholder involvement. We conduct SWOT analysis, so they're looking at what were the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So when they came up with this idea, we kind of examined it. And it could be done from afar because you could have somebody, if you're good at researching, they could be online doing some of the research that's there. So I encourage you to if you're motivated and enthusiastic and you're willing to work hard, you can work with anybody anywhere in the world virtually. Just say, hey, I'd like to contribute. This is what I can do, or how can I help? Um, you know, as teachers, we want to help somebody who's motivated. If you're just sitting in the back of the room, you're not engaged, you're not asking the questions, you know, it's that's not the way to get engaged and, and find a way to kind of bring your curiosity and find your purpose and passion. Yes, and um, I think um, also through my work with young people, I know that they're always concerned about their journeys. Are they making the right decision on the college? Uh, am I taking right classes? High schoolers are really stressed out of what college to go to, and um, am I declaring right major or not? What if I decide I don't want to do that? And there are a lot of people around we are taking uh, youth to talk to different professionals and their path is never straight line and, and you know it's really rare and actually those people who, and many of them end up like in their mid 40s in a position where they say, oh my gosh, why did I do what I did? Um, but it being, you know, we find that it's a flexibility and adding things onto what you're already doing. It's been, it's been the path for many successful people. Can you just tell the audience about your turns and twists and, and your background in terms of like you are the yeah you are the travel let's say age and I know you are you're a skier and and how do you end up in places uh, where are you at right now? 
So I guess the easiest way to say that is I told you before about, um, and I'll just be as transparent as I can, um, about the why the world is the way that it is. I grew up in mountain communities and in mountain towns and my dream at, or a large chunk of my dream was to be in the mountains and just ski. And when I realized that the world was as big as the place it is, I'm like, okay, I don't have money, um, but I wanna see the world and I wanna go ski all over the world. So I gotta figure out a way for someone to pay me to do that in some way, shape, or form. While I was doing those things though, I kept asking these questions why the world is the way that it is. And I didn't actually find the answers I was looking for in a traditional classroom that often until the end of my undergraduate time, the first time um, in college. But at that time, I started finding people that put a lot more resistance um, on systems of inequality and oppression in this world to people on the planet. And that's where I found myself. So I was basically like, I'm gonna be a ski bum that is walking in the streets and trying to take down oppressive structures in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that, that was seriously like, I didn't know, I didn't really have much of an, of an answer, but then I kind of kept building from there and I was like, okay, well, what are different ways to attack? Like, what does oppression mean? What are the, the interlocking systems of oppression? People that have read books like Bell Hooks and Bettina Love, like things like that. What, what do these things look like, right? How do these things come together? Because a lot of folks in certain worlds that I keep wouldn't want to talk about any of that stuff. You know, they just want to talk about the ski stuff or on the other side, you know, if you're not a radical organizer and you're really pushing for systemic change on massive scales, they're like, I don't want, I don't want to give you the time of day. So I was kind of like, oh, I don't really know what to do. But it was what jumped out to me the most. It's what pulled on me the most. So I, I, I feel like my answer really is that I continue to seek it out. I mean, I have a crew here that I'm, that I'm working with that, you know, I look to you all and like these other folks that we're meeting today and I'm like, who knows if we can, can't come up with something ourselves. And in the meantime, continue to do those things that kind of draw out the best in you. So I did find it though back in going um, through academic paths, to be honest, mm -hmm. and really respect the fact that if you can work with people <coughs> in a classroom and you can learn about historical context and tie yourself back into what theory actually means, you can really start to envision that another world could be possible. So that's kind of brought me back to the academic side. And I still ski quite a bit, but um, how we got to meet each other, I, I appreciate it, but in a much different way than I used to. It just doesn't feel quite the same. So things, letting, um, I would never say that is a linear path, at least from my perspective. It's complex and it's all over the place, but that's the beauty in the world. It's diversity, right? The bird teaches us that, our species teaches us that. So try to listen to that. Um, so I think everything you do is part of your journey. So I think we have to live in the moment and not be, oh, when I have this job or when I do this, I'm going to be happy. I mean, this may be it. We never know, right? So each thing that I've done is part of my journey. Um, it's led into that. Um, when I was a travel agent, I was always curious, like, why do certain people go on this kind of trip? Um, why does Mr. Ritter like to go to Las Vegas? If I had all his money, I'd go to Africa, or I would go to you know exciting, exotic places. But nope, he just wanted to go to Las Vegas. I mean, well, that's really boring. I didn't grow up traveling. You know, my family drove to Illinois for vacation. You know, so it's not like I grew up with this travel experience. Um, so being a travel agent was a way for me to kind of see the world because I'm like, I want to travel. I'm curious. I love learning about other cultures and trying other foods, meeting people. Okay, well, what's your, if you go home, what's your first thing that you're going to eat when you go home? You know, is it the soup or what does your mom or dad make for you? So just always curious about people and different cultures. So um, as the travel agent, being curious why other people weren't like me was kind of what led me to say, well, I want to go back to school and kind of explore this idea of, well, what makes somebody choose adventure travel? You know, is it my personality? Um, is it, you know, how I grew up? In my case, it wasn't how I grew up. So what, what kind of made that? So that's what I ended up looking at in, um, in school is examining adventure. And that's when I was like, well, there's really not a good ad adventure definition in terms of travel. Um, so that's what I worked on with the Adventure Travel Trade Association. And I reached out to them, cold, cold call, hey, I'm in graduate school, I was at Michigan State first year in, and uh, I'm really curious about the definition of adventure, could I work with you? 
and they're like, sure. So we started this project in 2004, and I've continued that partnership ever since with them. Um, they connected me with National Geographic Adventure, so for my dissertation, I collected data um, with National Geographic Adventure magazine. They supported my research. So again, putting myself out there, making that call, and saying, and being professional about it. I wasn't like, yo, I want to do some research. You know, I was like, hello, you know, explained a little bit about myself and what I was interested in doing and how can this be win-win. You're starting an association and you want to have market research, so I put questions they wanted in in my questionnaire, plus what the theory that I was trying to test about motivations. So again, make sure that it's win-win for those people. Don't be afraid to reach out. Make sure it's win-win, and always remember that along that path, those same people, it's a small space, the adventure travel world. So, you know, always treat people respectfully, and because um, it's your image all, 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 all the way along. So if you said to me 15 years ago that I'd be a professor at San Francisco State, I'd say, are you crazy? No way. Um, so be open to change. I mean, I was very happy as a travel agent. I got to travel all over the world. I was paid well. I had this opportunity to go to school, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and try that. And I was just willing, I guess, to go through some of those open doors and kind of release that security um, of, okay, yeah, I'm happy at my job, but you know, I'm also curious about this. So I followed that curiosity. And um, a year ago, I'm driving a U-Haul bus over the U-Haul <laughs> truck over the Golden Gate Bridge. Who would have thought, right? So more adventures going on. So yeah, I'd say just make those connections. Be willing to take that risk. Um, yeah, risk taking. And that's actually a perfect closing because uh, we're going to have a lunch break right now and this is your perfect time for all of you is to make connections.